Look, I already know what you're thinking. Somebody had a clandestine thumb on the deliberative roulette wheel to even consider placing a Tenkara film amongst the pantheon of cinematic angling chronicles you see here today. Quite frankly, I'm surprised I made the film. As it is, my peripheral fascination with this minimalist form of fly fishing and the subsequent expression of said fascination managed to trip a collective fly shop-centric epiglottal gag reflex that once guarded my masculinity. Now, I sit in exile, part of the castrati, part of some secondary chorus of eunuch tenors singing a counterpart to an off-Broadway score written by Isaac Walton. But this film isn't about trying to convince. It's simply about two things. The fact that Tenkara fishing merges the best memories of my boyhood, one of which is the time that my friend and I yanked 74 bluegill out of this culvert hole in 1983 using makeshift cane poles. The other is, can I make Tenkara look cool on film, all the while pitching a fly that has no indigenous relation to either Tenkara or western trout fishing? Oh, and there is one more thing. Can a film like this get me back in good standing with my western fly fishing buddies? At least without having to handicap their rhetorical golf scores by pointing out that a royal coachman has all the entomological subtlety of Mrs. O'Leary's cow. These are huge challenges, being that I am indescribably cheap and a notorious skin flint, completely uninitiated in the art of filmmaking. The first of these immediately meant that I'd find myself confined to using the camera from my iPhone 5 and the GoPro camera that I got for Christmas. The second part, however, meant that I'd be spending the better part of six months plundering YouTube and having an odd amalgam of professionals and upstart 15-year-olds teach me how to navigate the waters of Final Cut Pro and this other $900 program that'll allow me to make it look like my favorite fishing spots are on North Korea's strategic hit list. But the GoPro Hero 3 Black Edition demands extremity. These little point-of-view, waterproof, high-definition cameras with the ability to film up to 120 frames per second place me in a position of pressure. Sure, it's not a $50,000 red epic, but that's no excuse. Maybe you've never seen Tenkara fishing, but if you know anything about it, this endeavor, this supposed willow wanding, this nothing short of pedestrian and lacking in essential vainglory of fishing, does not exactly equal X Games material. What I need is chops, cuts, quick edits, flash, oatmeal filler, all accompanied by a bluesy driving rock soundtrack that takes my phlegmatic drift of a traditional Sakasa Kabari fly in medium current and makes it look like I'm base jumping from the face of El Capitan. Maybe that's a bit much, but since I don't snowboard or base jump or parachute, it's all I've got. That and the convoluted recollections of landing the biblical leviathan on a number 22 trico spinner, but anyways. The McLeod River is responsible for the proliferate distribution of the Oncorhynchus micus stoni, otherwise known as the McLeod River rainbows, all over the world. And despite the fact that McLeod is home to this vacant and presumably haunted old hospital that looks like it might be home to rogue ghost-hunting necromancers paging Captain Howdy with a Ouija board, McLeod itself is extraordinarily serene and perhaps the quietest logging town on the face of the planet. Me, I come here because it's beautiful. And because the peripheral latitude here and flat space in certain areas allow me the artistic liberties to blatantly composite dubious objects into what we call Z-space, which allows me the narcissistic fantasia of actually doing a Bear Grylls helicopter wave off when in all reality I'm five miles from a full utilities campground. Plus, I have no actual budget that indexes a decommissioned Cold War helicopter, so the Blackhawk composite is all I get. 
The traditional Tenkara fly isn't a surface sitter. It's a forward hackle wet fly. Nondescript. Downscale. Beholden to the riffle. My Tenkara rods are, respectively, 12 and 14 feet long and extremely sensitive to even the fits and turns of juvenile trout. And here's the rub. If it wasn't bad enough that I had my man card yanked at the fly shop door over a realist telescoping rod, the fact that A, I am using a dry fly at all, in direct and overt violation of all Tenkara Geneva codes, and B, my favorite dry fly is hot pink, despite the fact that it was designed by my daughter when she was three and a half years old, is enough to have me gutted at the ninth rib at the gate called tradition. So barring all of that, Barring my Molokai grade self-inflicted fishing leprosy, barring any and all blasphemy of aesthetic tradition, leaving even the nuanced and delicate waterways of the masters preferring to sail the high seas of ersatz angling with the patch over the good eye, I still managed to do one thing at the end of the day, and that's catch a few fish. And at the end of the heretofore referenced day, fly fishing is about playing fast and loose with the trout. It's about artifice, ruse, subterfuge, surreptitious gerrymandering of the subaquatic food cycle. Actually, trying to recapitulate the essential core of fishing into a cognitive science replete with Rorsach blots and neurotransmitter diatribes is kind of stupid. Fish don't care that a properly presented fly is attached to some guy holding a stick. In fact, I think we would all agree that is precisely what they do not know. It therefore follows that they have no concept of reels, double hauls, or high sticking, or whether or not my man card was an object to be taken away, given away, or ripped off, or whether they even understand what a man card is in the first place. So if it's about the fish, then my man card was no one's to have but me in the first place. Thank you very much. I'll see you at the gate. The gate marked dude. Lives getting tough for the common man. The rich and the greedy don't understand. Sorry, Luxie, that's